My name is Don Watkins. I'm an entrepreneur in residence here at Brigham. Uh, whoops, sorry. <laughs> I'm really sorry. I, I got a pretty good hit on Brigham Young in a minute on university, so we'll get even with them here in a second. Um, I, uh, I'm the executive chairman of Handstands. We produce, we're one of the largest producers of air car air fresheners in the world. And uh, let's see, I'm uh, executive chairman of Operation Smile. We operate on children throughout the world that have cleft lip and cleft palates. And that's something I've been involved with for 20 years. So it's an organization out of Norfolk, Virginia. And uh, again, I've worked on the national board and extremely rewarding. One of the huge benefits of of uh, having successful businesses, then you get lots of opportunities to help others. Let me ask this question. How many attended my lecture yesterday at the business school? Raise your hand real high. Okay, I'll just do a little bit of embellishing then to try to help you out a little bit. Yeah, you were, you were there. Not too many. That's great. Um, let's see. I'm going to tell you a fun story, entrepreneurial, a couple of entrepreneurial stories. Uh, some successful, one of them successful, two of them successful. One of them not so successful. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm, I come here and volunteer two days a week, Tuesdays and Wednesdays. I've been volunteering at Brigham Young University and at UVU for about 15 years in trying to help students not make some of the mistakes I made and uh, to try to uh, help enhance your education about entrepreneurship. Um, I tell my own kids, this tells you a lot when this is what I tell my kids, uh, and that is get as much education as you can. You'll find in my story I'm not Mr. Education, but I recommend you learn as much as you can. I think most of the, biz the entrepreneurial books that are written out there are mostly good and valuable, um, but there's nothing like learning from someone and having mentors who have made mistakes and uh, have had successes and learn from them and, and increase your learning uh, here at the university, hopefully. Then I encourage my own children to actually, a little different than some entrepreneurs, go out and work for someone for four or five years. Uh, the reason I say that is, is because most successful businesses... I kind of compare it, and you'll see it if you want to pick up a pamphlet here on your way out if you don't have one. It will give you an address in which you can make an appointment to come and see me on Tuesday and Wednesdays. And that, therefore, if you have a business that's already going well and you need some added mentoring, or if you're thinking about starting up a new business or just wanting to talk about your own skills, then I love talking one-on-one -on -one to students. My, my reason of coming here is... Uh, partly because I'm not needed at my business anymore. <laughs> We're doing a lot better now that I'm getting out of the way. A lot of entrepreneurs don't know how to get out of the way. Uh, I have such great intrapreneurs that uh, I'm bright enough that I know when to get out of the way of some great, great uh, uh, business people. I say intrapreneurs because they're not people that have gone out and started a business. But other than that, technically... Really, any successful business, sure, an entrepreneur, I think it was Bill Gates said the word is used extremely loosely, entrepreneur. Matter of fact, sometimes some of my buddies that are far better executives than I am that can stay in the role of CEO and grow the business to hundreds of millions, they win sometimes awards that tick me off called Entrepreneur of the Year. And Bill Gates, uh, who's a pretty good entrepreneur, said it's, the word is used Loosely, what designates, what separates an entrepreneur or an entrepreneur of the year? What, what should they have done different than an awesome CEO? What? Start a business. Okay, now I call, there's certain great CEOs that are tremendous managers and there's CEOs that are entrepreneurs and that means that, and that's why here today, I'm going to encourage you to be an entrepreneur, but I'm also going to encourage you to be an intrapreneur in case you don't start your own business. Because I'm going to tell you a little bit about Chris Anderson, who is the CEO now of my company as of two months ago that I've uh, taken the position of executive chairman of the board as the founder of the company with another buddy. 
he never started his own business. But he's growing my business far faster, far greater than I did when I started and created the business and had it grow for some uh, 25 years. 25 years, I built it up to about 23, 24 million. In the last 10 years, Chris has been a key, has been key to growing it to close to $70 million. And again, if you go into Walmart today and you look in the automotive industry, uh, section and look at air fresheners, there's 105 SKUs from six different companies, uh, including the tree. But you'll find that our company, under the brands of Refresh Your Car, um, Bahama, or Driven, we control 52 of those SKUs. So, uh, quite unheard of. The tree, we all know the tree, that's an 85, 90 year old company. And, uh, and now we're not, we've replaced them as number one at Walmart. Again, I'm going to help tell you some principles, not always so much about myself, but principles that I found are successful in whether or not you're an entrepreneur or an entrepreneur. Chris Anderson is uh, my CEO, certainly has ownership and is a multimillionaire because he brought in uh, entrepreneurial skills to the company that we'll talk about. Um, I kind of like to view it this way a little bit as an entrepreneur. If you're um, starting your own business and you're happy, it's probably because of three founding foundations of your stool, three legs that are extremely <laughs> critical in the, in the success of almost any business that you see. Uh, let's see, those that didn't attend the lecture yesterday, what is one of the key components of a successful business? What? 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 Money. Okay, money is one. That is handled by one of the legs that um, uh, I'll tell you about in a minute. So, so finance is a big deal. Uh, what, what's, what's really, when you think about a, a company, when you think about Apple, what do you think about? They're what? They're products. That's what you, that we, if you want an exciting business, and uh, then what we do is we have, and this is such a technical word I'm going to share with you. You know, scientifically, if you come up with something that's incredible, you think it's incredible, to solve pain or create pleasure, if you do that to the 1 out of 10, the 10 degree or 9 degree, there's a fair chance you've got something. Okay, and so the iPhone and different things like that. These are air fresheners, obviously. This one we adapted uh, a successful air freshener that hangs from your uh, um, rear view mirror. And we thought someone said, hey, in the company, hey, why don't we do that for kids' lockers? And I happen to have extras of those. So that's why you got them instead of the ones that the Bahama that hang from the car. But generally speaking, if you uh, grab one of these products and pull it out, uh, based on a lot of other air fresheners, we get quite a comment of wow. And, uh, and, and so sure enough, the product has to be or the service has to be a wow. Okay, what might be another leg? It, it, it would incorporate finance, but if you were going to invest with someone, You'd want that product to be a wow, but is that it? Is that, is that all that really matters? I'm sorry. I'd say a hustle or sales. Okay, he'd say sales. You just have to have a good team. Ah, that's right. And the sales would include the team, but it's, it's a team. When we go look at, when I've talked to investors that invest in companies, they want that product to be an eight, nine, or 10. But what they look at more important than the product is the team. And the team is made up of, I've heard two of them, I, I like to think of four components of the team. The team is made up of, what do we say with an S? Sales. Sales and marketing. Okay, to me, oh my gosh, sales is, is just everything. And I'll teach you why it's 
everything. It isn't, there's a salesman that, or a woman that will go out and deliver the product and say, hey, hey, I'm selling you that product. That's not the type of sales I'm talking about. I'm talking about entrepreneurial or entrepreneurial sales. That is the kind of sales that understands. By the way, here's a good way to bring it home. I have to put up here uh, this or I'll forget what I was saying. That's why they get rid of me at the company. You'll find through this lesson today, I'll forget a lot of stuff. Like what I was just going to say. Okay, here's the difference. Uh, let, let's first go to this. Well, no, how many of you would like to be your own boss? What on earth is that? Who, what, who do you know that is their own boss? Tell me about them. Go ahead, be brave. I mean, I'm ripping on it a little bit, but tell me who's their own boss. Tell me somebody. Yes, sir. Someone that works at home. This is at home and runs their own company. Okay. No, I mean, tell me somebody, a real person that you know is their own boss. Come on, there's some of you guys in here that have your own companies. Yes, sir. Uh, mother and father. You, you, they do? What is their company? What's their father's company? Uh, they run an electrician company. El electrical company? Okay, and so he's his own boss, huh? He doesn't have a boss. He doesn't have any customers, does he, that boss him around? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, oh, okay, we'll come back over here. Flexibility is a key to business. Uh, okay. You know what? I, I, I've never worked really, except for a small degree, a hospital I'll talk to you about in a minute, but I've never really worked for somebody. But believe me, I have a boss. And my boss, I don't work for from 8 in the morning until 5 at night. And I don't think your father does if he has a successful business. If someone, a customer, a good customer, a contractor, or somebody calls him up, and it's 10 o'clock at night and they've got a big problem, is he their boss? Is he your dad's boss, the customer? Yeah, unless they don't want the customer anymore. Customer is what? King. Customer is king. In sales, um, I like companies, entrepreneurial companies, especially that are driven by the sales team. By the sales team that understands customer is king. As opposed to some companies that get successful and then before too long, they've developed an incredible product development team that is great and is proactive, but not necessarily tied to sales. Why is that potentially damning? Pardon me? Products begin not to sell. It be starts to become the world of the inventor or the creator. Entrepreneurs generally, in my opinion, a lot of this is my opinion, uh, that entrepreneurship is no perfect science. You're going to hear different opinions. You apply which ones work to you. But a lot of entrepreneurs think and come in with, first of all, ideas. They come up with, uh, what time do we end? 1250. They come in with all these ideas. And I go, that's really cool, that's really cool, that's really cool. And then I pull out this little jar of dimes. And I go, take one. Because what? An idea is what? A dime a dozen. It's all, in the, it's all in the development of the product, and it's all in the team. And now back to the team. Okay, so we have sales, which is critical. And let me end with this again, tying product. We have at our company the most creative sales team around. I mean, these guys, maybe some of you are like these guys. They're weird. They are strange. I try to have my company over the years a dress standard. Oh no, we can't have a dress standard for these people. You know what? They're in their own world. Okay? Now, but different than saying they're over there, here's what happens. Chris Anderson, now the CEO, who handles and will always handle our $20 million account Walmart because he always wants to know exactly what's a critical to the customer. He always comes back to the product team and says, I want a necklace. And I need it to just smell unbelievably for females. 
and I need the packaging to be fit this high school female demographic. That isn't, you know, this isn't your demographic. Uh, the Bahama would have been nice. Um, but I just need it to be unbelievable. And then they have a lot of creativity in that world. But they don't get to go, no, today I want to create a whole new air freshener. I want to create something that's absolutely, oh, just knocks the world off. Like the bug. I'll tell you about the bug in a minute. So we have sales tied to product development. We have finance, which is huge. I recommend that each of you have, uh, keep a budget, even though your finances may not be too great. Keep a budget. I recommend that you use QuickBooks. Even again, it's redundant. It'll be too much for you. You'll say it isn't worth the time, but it'll teach you basic accounting principles that will help you in your business. Um, so we have finance. Uh, we have sales and marketing. We have ongoing product development team, and we have one other. We have one other. And a matter of fact, if, if we have the best products, that, uh, designs that Walmart loves and the customer loves, and they keep being the best designs, and the salesmen are doing their job, and we're financially making money, uh, there's another area. It's kind of like football. It's kind of like a group of guys that really don't get that much credit. Huh? Purchasing? Uh, yes, but purchasing would then come under the operations. Thank you. If we don't ship to Walmart at about a 97, 98% fulfillment level, in other words, when they say ship, you ship and you have it and you get it there, we get recorded on that. And our record is like 99. It's unbelievable. So my sales team are all stars. My uh, product development team are all stars. My uh, finance people are top all stars. But our operations people, they don't get much fanfare or anything, but they're the ones who keep us in business. They're the ones that are protecting that quarterback. So now, what's the third leg? What's the third leg of a successful business? What? Luck. Yeah, timing. I say luck, timing, absolutely. So right on. So those are the three components. We're going to talk, the other component today, and I'll get to the story right now, is inventors, again, back to inventors, it's my opinion that great entrepreneurs aren't necessarily the Steve Jobs uh, inventors. <coughs> Generally speaking, entrepreneurs are tremendous uh, people that can see an opportunity, help to organize a team to create a product or service that fulfills that to a high degree and, um, um, and puts that team together for a successful organization. Inventors, if you're a product developer and you have a great invention, that's awesome. But, general, but that doesn't mean you'll be a successful business person, does it? Because you've got this whole other area that you've got to cover. Now do you kind of understand why, generally speaking, there's exceptions to this rule, but generally speaking, I want you to get a good education to learn the different components and principles and, and get some experience so that you have a better chance of helping find, coming together with a great product and then putting together with a great team. And uh, so how does that sound, uh, uh, head MBA lady, Tammy? Does that sound okay? We have our, uh, are, you, are you back to teaching or are you still ahead of the MBA program? Oh, doing both, okay, well, anyway. So stand, feel free to say, Don, you're full of junk on that one. Uh, Tammy, if you want. Although I did, did give you a free air freshener. Yeah, okay. Okay, guys, here's a fun story. I'm going to go through it kind of quick. Uh, by nature, I am ADD. Uh, I am obsessive, and uh, I take gifts, and I use what some people call as, uh, when you have children and they're ADD, you will not call that a gift. You will call that a pain in the neck. Uh, but what you do is you take, and I, and B, have self-awareness, understand your strengths, Understand your weaknesses and uh, try to turn them, the weaknesses into strengths. Okay, so uh, going to college, when I teach at Brigham Young University and I have a bunch of students come in for a lecture, I say, t I made it into BYU some 60, almost uh, 40 years ago. 
And uh, I made it into Brigham Young University, and I didn't do very good on ACT, and I didn't do extremely well in grades. As a matter of fact, my father has his, uh, just passed away a year or two ago, is a PhD in educational psychology, top IBM salesman for 30 years, uh, very wonderful, kind, wonderful father. Absolutely great, except for one area, he was a pain. My older brother had a photographic, has a, well, had a photographic memory and uh, passed the CPA exam first time. My older sister did extremely well in school. I was average. I was very average. And every time I came home from school with my report card, this wonderful, kind, educational psychologist, IBM salesman, lost his cool. And he would be angry and raise his voice, which he usually never did, and said, this is unacceptable from you. And you're being lazy and you're not doing the type of things you ought to be doing. You ought to get your act together. One day I was sitting there at uh, Centerville Elementary School before we moved to the Bay Area where I grew up most of the time. And uh, I found myself taken down to the principal's office. I went into a little room. I can still picture it with a lady. We played with what I learned to be later, an IQ test. Uh, with blocks and different things, and uh, I still don't know what she was doing, and the test verified it, and I came home that night, and my dad had gotten the word, and it was great, because he wasn't angry anymore, he was just sad. <laughs> That's how I remember it. I just remember he wasn't as mad anymore, he was just sad that the IQ wasn't where it ought to be. Very sad story. Anyway, uh, life went on. I went to, uh, 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 one of the things I'm good at, and again, you have to look at your own strengths. Uh, I don't know if IQ tests measure strategists. I don't, I'm really good at solving problems. And so I, maybe just the IQ test I like to think doesn't measure that for some reason. I'm a pretty good team builder, as I'll explain, a mayor of Alpine City. And, and things were really disruptive over there, and we put together a team, and I have lots of friends. I have about seven in town that still say I'm an idiot, but most come up and say, best way the town's ever been run. And basically, it was I brought a team together, a team of people that learned how, that could debate and disagree without being disagreeable. Wouldn't that be great in our country if the politicians could learn that principle? That they could really learn how to have a good debate, come to consensus, come to majority, but at the end of the day, respect a different point of view without personal attacks. So we did that in that organization. So I'm pretty good at solving problems, it, not myself really, but by analyzing the problem and pulling the team together. Now, individually, I have done some pretty good strategy deals. The best deal I've ever done is my wife. She is amazing. She is a perfect entrepreneurial wife. She's a perfect all-around wife. Um, Peggy, she, uh, I, mar I uh, got, went on an LDS mission. I came back in a setting somewhat like this. I sat down in the front row for church. Before church was over, I'd fulfilled this mission. I turned around, what, for what reason? Before the meeting started, I turned around, for what reason? Checking out the girls. That's my number one next assignment. So I check that out, and I turn around, and I look back here about where this blonde lady is, and, and, and sure enough, she, my wife's a blonde. I turn around, and I went, oh, by the way, what's an incredible product called? Wow. wow. It's that simple. I turned around and went, wow. I didn't say that. I turned around, and I focused on the meeting. When the meeting was done, uh, I go, okay. I turn around, I watch this little, this beautiful blonde walk over, walk down the aisle. I'm sitting here with my cousin, cousin Norm. Cousin Norm's two years younger than I am. He, we're best friends. He's from Arizona. Our dads work for the same company. Norm, I, this is a ripoff. Norm's, my dad and his dad are full brothers. But his, my dad's about, was even an inch shorter than me, just as bald. His dad, you know, 6'3". My dad's full brother, full head of hair. Norm, sure enough. Norm played for BYU baseball, called Storm and Norman as a freshman. All the home runs. He's about 6'4", full head of hair, and uh, tanned Arizona. You know, he was a stud. So anyway, uh, anyway, she gets down to our level. I hurry and sit down, just within seconds. Why did I hurry and sit down? No confidence. What? No confidence. No confidence? Me? <laughs> Come on. No, I have confidence. Why did I hurry and sit down? Who said that? 
Yes. I was shorter. I didn't want her to make the mistake of her life. Misjudging me. Ruin her whole life. Confidence. I sat down. I let her flow by. Oh, boy, I can still remember that. And anyway, I get back to my apartment. Jim Downs, been a missionary buddy of mine. i uh, been there in the summer. I said, hey, who was that blonde? He goes, that was Peggy Tuttle. I go, Peggy Tuttle. I go, he goes, I'm going over there to her apartment for lunch because uh, Melody, uh, I think it was, no, it wasn't Melody. Anyway, uh, she's over there, and that's my girlfriend. I said, perfect. Goes over there, comes back, and I said, hey, did she say anything about me? <laughs> And this is 100% true, no embellishment. No, but she had a lot of questions about your cousin. Oh, my gosh. You know what? That wasn't a problem. He was off on his mission to Argentina in two more weeks. <laughs> and she still doesn't feel bad. Big Norm. Anybody know Norm in Arizona? He's the best guy in the world. But he's pushing about 340. <laughs> you know, so all that muscle turned into a little extra size. So <laughs> he's a great guy. Married a great Sue, a great, a great, great gal. Anyway, strategy. See that? My IQ, in my case, isn't anything to knock your socks off. I can't remember half the stuff. But I do have another ability that a lot of people that are entrepreneurs, I tell them, and it's kind of tough when you come and see me sometimes, I'll say, you know what? You have the wrong idea of entrepreneurship. You're maybe a dreamer. And I don't mind ticking you guys off because if I'm, if I'm wrong, good. If that fires you up, sometimes my parents fired me up by saying some things. They were great parents. But we're not, I'm not a dreamer. I work hard. And a matter of fact, I obsess and I can focus. And a matter of fact, those BYU students, again, when they're sitting in there in the, the big auditorium, I will say, I could not have gotten into BYU today with my IQ. And they're kind of going, yeah, you know, I'm pretty good. And I go, but I'll beat every one of you in business every time. Ooh, that ticks them off. That fires them up. Let me give you an example how and what I do with my weakness to turn it into a strength. Peggy and I had been married a couple of weeks and I needed to, uh, she was a dental assistant. Funny story, I'm not going to tell you this one. Second date, first date was horrible, by the way. I, had, I just wanted to make a tough challenge tougher. Uh, bad date. The second date went better. And on the second date, I go, I know, Peggy, we will never marry. I know we will never marry. But I've always kind of enjoyed numbers and business and budgeting and making money. And I go, you know what? You're a full-time dental assistant here on the south side of Brigham Young University. An apartment costs a uh, no, I was in Casa Grande. She was in Miller Apartments. I said, do uh, you mind if I ask how much you make a month? She goes, no, $640. I go, do you mind if we kind of, I know we will never marry, but could, we, could I play and see if we, could, if we got married, if we could live off your income? <laughs> Crazy. I'm just trying to show you how dumb I am to show you how you can still be successful. I just wanted not only to be shorter than her, I'm actually a quarter of an inch uh, taller. I, that's what I really believe. Uh, but I just want to show you that I like a challenge. I want to dig myself into a big hole. Well, anyway, bottom line is I did convince her and, and best deal I've ever made. And we have a wonderful family. So she, um, uh, anyway, we got married and I needed a part-time job because I really didn't like my classwork anyway. And so I went up to the BYU to the board and I, I got a job as a garbage man up to BYU. I, I uh, went and emptied garbage in, in the class. I love that job because I love being outside. I love moving. I don't, I, it'd kill me if they asked me to stay behind that little lectern or whatever it's called. Kill me. I just can't do that. Uh, and I don't have to go to the bathroom. That's not the problem. So, I'm sitting there and I get this job and after a couple weeks we go down and meet her grandmother. I'd never met her grandmother before and she would live in a little apartment over by Utah Valley Hospital, at, which is what it was called then, Utah Regional. And she was in a little apartment. She's a sweet little lady, really sweet little lady. And she, and she went in and I met her and stuff. We'd been married a couple weeks and she goes, what do you do? And I go, I go to Brigham Young University. She goes, oh, you go to Brigham Young University. She goes, well, my, my granddaughter here is working. Are you working? I go, yeah, I'm a sanitation engineer. I go, no, I do, I, I do, I'm a garbage man. And I never really had thought about it until the grandma asked. 
And then you can kind of see grandma going, oh, this was a great daughter. She's beautiful. You're short, you're getting bald fast, and now you're a garbage man. This isn't good. So uh, Peggy says, in hindsight, that's, that's one of the stories I embellished, that she really liked me and she thought it was funny. But anyway, I went away from that going, you know what, that's kind of, that doesn't sound too good for my wife, my beautiful wife that I've married, that I'm a garbage man. So, you know what, Peggy, I, as I've told you, with Operation Smile, I love going with these doctors and nurses and raising money to operate on kids. 45 minutes, these doctors and nurses give their free time. 45 minutes, it's like a miracle that happens to a child that's hideous, that can't come out of the house, that kids make fun of, can't talk, and in 45 minutes, their life is changed miraculously by these surgeons and nurses. So anyway, I said, I, I don't have the brains and the stamina and the discipline to be a doctor, but I'm going to be a hospital administrator because I love people, I love business, and uh, so that's what I'm going to do. She goes, oh, that's great, that's great. She doesn't get carried away. She really doesn't listen to me a whole lot. Uh, and that's smart with ADD people. You don't get high, you don't get low, you just go, you know what, you do your job, I trust you, I'll do my job. So anyway, I go down to Mark Howard at the, at the, at the regional hospital administrator. What did I go down there for? He's the administrator. I met with him for a half hour. Why would I go down there? Okay, but what, what is, so what am I going to do? Go take over his job? What did I go down there for? Yeah, you go to mentors. Use mentors a ton. Most of us have egos and we love to share what we have done. A lot of them don't share as many mistakes as they should share, but... Uh, uh, so anyway, I went down there to Utah Valley, uh, down to the, and I networked with him. We had a great visit, great visit. And I go, you know what? I really want to be a hospital administrator. So I said, hey, can I get a job here? Networking, right? And he goes, hey, go down to the HR department. I hustled down the HR department. Sorry, you've heard this story a couple times. I uh, went down the HR department, walk in there, a lady comes out, and I go, I need a job here as an orderly. She goes, you know what, there are only eight orderlies in this hospital. There's very little changeover. And there's probably 100 pre-med students at Brigham Young University that want those eight orderly jobs. Why do those pre-med students want those eight orderly jobs? Any of you that are thinking about pre-med? Pardon me? Service hours and just looks good on your resume. You worked in the hospital for a couple of years. So a huge demand job. And I'm, you know, I'm sitting here going, didn't Mark Howard call you and say, this kid's unbelievable? Remember the confidence? I do have confidence. It's blind confidence, it's ignorant confidence, but I have it. So anyway, no, no. So anyway, most people start to enter stinking thinking at this point. Remember, I'm a problem solver. Remember, I do focus. I do work hard. I do obsess on things. And so where most people walk out and go, I can't get a job there. It's all stacked against me. I'm going to have to stay with the garbage man. So I go home, but because of my uh, gifts... I, I don't sleep for a couple nights. Why don't I sleep? I'm trying to strategize, come up with an angle. Most companies don't reinvent the wheel. They come up with angles. And I'll hit that hard again in a few minutes. They come up with an angle. Well, I'm going up with angles. I'm coming up with angles. I, ah, I, I got it. Three days later, I walk into the hospital. I walk up to the pink ladies and I say, hey, I want to be a pink lady. And they go, oh, that's cute. What do you mean? I go, no, I want to be a pink lady. They go, what do you mean? I go, what, can't I do something to volunteer in this hospital? They go, sure, you can deliver the flowers. I go, perfect, perfect. So on the third day of delivering flowers to Mrs. Butler in the operating room at Utah Valley Hospital, which is what it was called then, she grabs me, comes outside and says, I need to talk to you. I go, yes, ma'am. She goes, what are you doing here? And I said, I'm uh, she goes, I know you're delivering flowers. You've been doing it for three days. What are you doing? And I said, I'm passionate, I'm hardworking, I have good integrity, I'm dedicated, I want to be a hospital administrator, I can't seem to get a job here, and so I'm going to volunteer until someone does hire me. She goes, you're hired. And I worked there for a year and a half. So, so I do know how to work hard, I do know how to focus, and I do have a gift of strategy. And a lot of that strategy just involves getting other people that are better at, I just can understand the mission at hand. Uh, and I know how to solve that mission, usually with other people. Oftentimes I get the credit. It's very easy for me in my own brain to go, 
Yeah, I did a good job of understanding the problem. I did a good job of motivating the people, but I didn't solve the problem. I really do keep that in mind. It's very clear to me the part that I can play and the part that I can, I can uh, take. Well, anyway, um, I ended up selling real estate, having a hard time getting through school. It took me 10 years to get through uh, Brigham Young University with a bachelor's in U unit, no, hospital administration. No, they didn't have one there. I made up my own personnel classes, OB classes, counting classes to make my own uh, supposedly uh, a bachelor's degree in pre Masters of Hospital Administration, but it was really quite easy courses I put together. And I graduated in university studies. <laughs> Don't do that if you want a job. <laughs> Don't do that. Okay, so I started selling real estate on the hill. Long story short, I ended up uh, at about 25, 26 years old starting a real estate and construction company. Built a lot of big homes up on the hill of Provo Hills. Built one of Donnie Osmond's homes that he came and bought. Very, very successful. Ended up building, uh, by before I'm 30, a huge home out in, not, pretty big size home out in Alpine. Had a nice big boat out behind it. Had a nice Mercedes. It was a diesel. Um, and life was great. We had this nice house. Uh, I, I then had an opportunity to leverage and put all of my savings, which I thought was about seven, eight hundred grand, up into a development in Bountiful in the south end of Bountiful Golf Course. Anybody know where Sunset Hollow is on the south? You know where that is. If you notice, there's a huge concrete wall going in. That cost us a fortune to put in the infrastructure into that place. Soon, but my dad came to me at that time and he said, son, I'm very proud of you. Uh, he'd forgot my IQ level. And uh, he said, listen, you're a darn good father. You're a good husband. You're a good little uh, deacon's quorum advisor in the LDS church. You're a good son. You're all these things, but you have way too much debt. Way too much debt. I said, oh, dad, you're living in the 40s. You're living in the depression. I understand where you're coming from. We won't ever have those days again. Well, in 1980, about this time, when I put every dime up there, as a matter of fact, I got an extra mortgage on my home, so I had three mortgages on my home, so that when that development went through, I wouldn't only be worth 750 grand, I would now be worth 1.5 million. I would take $500,000 and I would pay off all the debts on my home, and then I would put a half a million dollars, I forgot about all the taxes I'd get to pay, and I'd, I'll do all these great things with it. Well, interest rates, after getting in that huge uh, road, uh, interest rates went to 22%. All real estate stopped. Isn't that interesting? All real estate's kind of stopped here for us for a long time, hasn't it? What are interest rates? Nothing. So don't be fooled that you know the answer of the future. Find a balance in your life. Uh, so anyway, I all but went bankrupt. I didn't file bankruptcy, but I owed it about 20 grand. Luckily sold my house, paid off all my debts, and moved into a lousy little rental yep, by in South Jordan that uh, stunk of cat urine. Um, before too long, I went to my wife, by the way, after I knew we were going to have to sell the house and do whatever we could. We we're so blessed to sell that house so our credit stayed good. Uh, I went to her and I said, honey, by the way, I am an optimist. Did you get, grab onto that yet? I'm very positive, almost unrealistically positive. Uh, my wife says sometimes, you know, if we, you know, so-and-so just, you know, maybe over here lost their life. And I'm sitting here going, man, the spirit world's awesome. They're having a great time. They don't have the problems they have here on earth. She's going, could we mourn for maybe a month? Maybe a week? Could you shed a tear for the family? You know, so, so yes, I have a little bit of a problem that way at times. So she came to me and I said this to her. It looks like you married a loser. It looks like, you know, I am out of control and I was crazy. And she, she just looked me in the eye and she says, hey, she goes, you're not a loser. I'm not worried a bit about our future. Wow. Did I marry the right wife? As we move out into a little cat urine joint. Wow. She says, I'm not worried a bit about you. Truth is, she goes, it wasn't your fault. It was half my fault. The economy going to 22% interest rate and stopping wasn't my fault. But my lack of preparation and finding balance in my life and needing to make an extra million with, by the time I'm 32 
you know what? I love business. I don't work anymore for money. I work because I love business. It's a blast. Well, after that business failure, we had an opportunity to come and to, um, through some other problems, we came up with an opportunity in which uh, uh, I came to my wife and I said, hey, it's 1983. I said, I got a buddy and I, a uh, buddy wants to start a business and it's selling dust covers to computer stores. Uh, I don't know if any of you kids can remember your parents hanging around an Apple IIe or a, a little, the first Macs, the little Macs and the little computers. So we, we uh, threw a, a, a problem with uh, uh, someone else we were helping that kind of, if you will, took advantage of us and cut us out of a deal. We decided we'd start our own dust cover company. And so here's what we did. We uh, said, okay, if you're, if you're going to kind of screw us on this commission, we'll start our own dust cover company and we'll make vinyl dust covers. <coughs> I never made dust covers. My partner was a computer, uh, a AT&T telephone sales type guy uh, in technology, just starting up. And so we wanted to start a dust cover company. Where did we go to find uh, dust covers to, to make? Where would we find the material, ladies? Where would we find vinyl material? Fabric store, went to a fabric store, looked at the end of the fabric, see I'm a problem solver, it wasn't too tough. Looked inside, said Intex Plastics. We drove to California, we found the plastics manufacturer, the, the nice salesman came out and said, who's gonna sew them? We go, we don't know. He goes, oh, how about my Korean buddy in Fountain Valley next door? Great, went over there. We made up some samples. My, I, didn't, I was starting to sell real estate for a buddy. I'd lost my own real estate and construction company and I went and started selling and trying to make some money selling real estate. My buddy was still with AT&T. Before he wanted to leave his good job that he made very good money on 40 years ago, well, 30 years ago at about $60,000, $70,000 a year with AT&T, wonderful benefits. He didn't want to just leave that and uh, where I didn't really have much going on. He, um, we decided to make some samples. So we got some samples made before he left his job. Didn't cost a lot of money. Probably made, probably it was 500 bucks. We made some samples made. We got some packaging done. We took our samples in. We thought it was a wow. We took the product into three Apple stores in Salt Lake and said, here, we knew that the, the, the product would probably cost us $2 to make and $4 we'd sell to them. So we'd make $2 gross profit. We'd tell the store to sell it for $8. We walked in there. They hadn't seen dust covers before for the Apple computers. And of course, they would have said no. But like working at the hospital, I said these covers are free. Why would I say such a thing? Well, get you in the door. What? Get you in the door. Get in the door? I just want to see if they'll sell. I want to know if the product really is a wow. I don't, uh, you know, I don't need to pat my own self and say, oh, I know it's good. No, when you guys come to ideas with me, I go, that's great. And you'll, a lot of you will come to me and say, is this a good idea? I'll go, hey, am I your market? Probably not. I'll tell you how you can find out if it's a good idea. Get some samples made. If you can't get the samples made, you're probably in too big of a business because you're not probably going to get a lot of money from anybody. Start a business that you can start and learn the principles of a business. So uh, we got the samples made. We put them in the stores. Two weeks, three weeks later, they were all sold. And we made sure they sold them for eight bucks because that then, you know, it didn't do any good if they sold them for four bucks or or they didn't sell because they were trying to sell them for 12. Well, it worked. So I went back to my wife and I said, honey, thanks for believing in me. And uh, you know what? You're kind of tired of the winters here, aren't you? It was back when Geneva was cooking and we had a lot of smog in the wintertime. Where we couldn't even hardly see in front of ourselves. And I said, honey, you know what? We got four of the seven kids. I said, honey, how about... Uh, I've been talking to my buddy. We know we got a winning product. He's more of an operations detail guy. He is a good salesperson, my partner. But we made a really good team. I'm good in sales and marketing. He's really good. I'm good in finance. He was really good in operations and sales. And he was good in product development, ongoing product development. So I said, Peg, there's thousands of computer stores around the country. So how about we move out of this, what? urine stink house and how about we buy a brand new motorhome it's only 350 bucks a month brand new 34 foot motorhome and oh we don't have the mercedes anymore we have this little you can't tell this picture there's a little subaru on a car trailer thing there 
And how about we buy that and we head out in the western United States. We'll go to Arizona first. It's February. And we'll go there and I'll hook you up behind my Norm's dad, who was LDS bishop. We'll hook up behind his church house and unhook. And you teach the kids till 1 o'clock. Let them out with their big wheels and let them have the whole church parking lot. And I'll unhook the Subaru and I'll go sell dust covers all day long to computer stores. She goes, you are unbelievable, Don. I go, I know. <laughs> she didn't say you're unbelievable. Remember, her highs aren't real high, her lows aren't real low, but she did say that sounds fun. We went out and did that, and we started our business in 1983. Computer accessories, when we got up to San Francisco, my partner called after trying on dust covers. <laughs> top top AT&T salesperson, now he's making dust covers and patterns. And uh, we get the pattern made, then he sends it to L.A., and then they get covers get shipped up overnight. He gets them packaged um, and all these different things. But he calls me and he goes, Don, I was in measuring one of the computers, and there was a mouse, there was a, a mouse they call, and a little mat underneath it. Hey, can't we make those? I said, I had seen the same thing. Hey, we can make those too. We got customers that really like our product. They like us now. If we come along with new products, we can just send it down the lane here. Hey, mouse mats, what does that remind you of? Remember I used to go to Lake Powell a lot with a big boat? What does it remind you of, mouse mats? Scuba material. So we found out where scuba material was made. It was made back in Grondike, back east. They'd send us big rolls. We didn't have $100,000 to buy a clicker machine. So we found a company that die cuts things out. They die cut this roll of materials for eight cents. Geez, we had these, these mats made for 40, 50 cents. We'd sell them to the stores for $2.50 back in the old day. And uh, we became the largest manufacturer in the world of mouse mats, along with many other cases and accessories. About 10 years ago, um, I uh, always am good and enjoy. It's not just that I'm good. I, I, I enjoy talking to young people about businesses. A young person by the name of Chris Anderson, 20 years ago, uh, this young guy, he's different than me. His IQ is 180. He has a photographic memory. He put himself through Westminster College, only person I know to get a perfect uh, 4.0 in economics ever before or since. He's brilliant. He's also weird because he's a really good salesman. A lot of times you don't get both. The Lord kind of gives you either good brains or a really good big mouth. He has, he has both. And so anytime I'd go in the store, as a matter of fact, today, cutting this short, I have at my farm, I, have, I don't have as big a house as I used to have at one time, but I have a nice house, I have a nice farm and out in Alpine. And I have two big tractors. He's such a good salesman. He put himself through skill, school selling tractors. And now, he, over the 10 years that I knew him, 20, from 20 years ago up to about 10 years ago, he sold me two tractors. Every time I'd go in there, after he'd sell me and exceed my expectations, he would take, say, can we go out back and talk? And then he would push me for a half an hour on ideas and strategies of business. Always asking. Finally, about 10 years ago, he came to me and he says, Hey, Don, I uh, have a chance to go to MBA school at Stanford, or I can start my own business. Would you go into business with me? I said, Yes, I would, because you are a winner. You've now got a great education. You've had a lot of experience. I will invest money with you. He goes, Great. We tried to buy out the tractor store. We didn't agree on the price with the owner. And so he came back, and I said, Well, watch for another opportunity. He goes, No, I don't want to watch. I want to come work for your company. I go, No, I really don't have an opportunity for you. He says, come on, come on. And so anyway, he came into the company. Within a year, uh, we, we, one of the products we make is a sticky pad. No adhesive, no magnet. Sticks on your dash, holds your cell phone. Uh, he got, we were mostly, our distribution was in cell phone, ty electronic type areas with mouse mats, cases, and things. He came in and got that little pad in all automotive stores. At the end of one year, he said, Don, you told me that selling tractors isn't the best because when you're at Lake Powell and you're water skiing, you can think and stop there for a minute and go, people all over the world are making me money right now selling mouse mats. <laughs> if I'm not back at the tractor store, I'm not making any money. So, but you know what, Don, it's been a year. I, I make a commission on what I sell. What are we going to sell next in the automotive industry? Uh, you start selling dust covers and then you brought in mouse mats. I've gotten a sticky pad in everywhere you said I couldn't get it in because these stores wouldn't take one product. I got in there. What are we going to sell next? I said, I don't know. He goes, I know. We're going to go in the air freshener business. I said, nope. That's a mature industry. There's too much competition. When I started dust covers in 1983, there was no competition. 
It was much easier. Air fresheners, a tree owns half the market, and 10 other companies. Anyway, we came up with a product called the Bug. I won't show it to you. It's, it was the most new and inventive idea out there. Very inventive. When we come up with new angles, it's either a slight angle or it's a huge angle. Well, this angle, this idea was a bug. And it was a little uh, gel type thing that stayed on your dash. It was phenomenal. I think it's the best air freshener we ever made. We took it to the Walmart buyer and went in there. And what do you think the Walmart buyer said when he saw it? Wow. wow. Said wow. Brought it in, brought in two. Here's the key. That, those two came in for six months and are out. I think the best air fresher we made, because you have the best product, if you're not tied to the customer, too bad. Too bad. But as Chris left that office that day, and here's where the incredible, and what I'll close on, incredible salesman that's not just a salesman. He's an entrepreneur. He's a business builder. As he gave the two bugs to the buyer, and that was our first customer, and we'd be delivering in about four months from now. He asked the buyer, he said this, by the way, before I leave, is there anything you're unsatisfied with with air fresheners? The buyer goes, come back in and sit down here. That's a miracle for a Walmart buyer. Come and sit down here. I sell air fresheners. Air fresheners come from the automotive industry, males, 15 to 25, black ice. My buyers at Walmart are what? 70% what? Female. Nobody is listening to me and making car air fresheners for females. He said, yes, ma'am. Came home, told me that story. I went, oh my gosh, I'll put all my resources in my company behind you. And we came out with the wildest air fresheners so that when the bug was too innovative and buyers didn't buy it because they didn't know what it was, we came up with incredible air fresheners that were just a little bit of an angle off of what else was already being sold, but they were female friendly. And now we have Refresh that dominates a huge part of the market. Even at automotive stores, Refresh Your Car Female does really well. We have Bahama, Novelty, and now Driven. Thanks very much. I had a good time. I hope you did too.